tax freight train is bearing down on your retirement. To protect yourself, you'll have to harness the power of zero. Hey folks, this is David McKnight. Welcome to the Power of Zero show. I am the best-selling author of The Power of Zero, Look Before You Lerp, The Volatility Shield, and most recently, Tax-Free Income for Life. All of those books can be bought in bulk. You can combine orders and get bulk discounts all on one website at davidmcknight.com. If you are looking for someone to help you navigate the path to 0% tax bracket, we'd be happy to introduce you to a a uh, member of our elite POZ advisor group that has been trained, qualified, and vetted personally by me. And if you're an advisor who wants to transition your practice to a Power Zero style practice, head on over to powerzero.com and set up a phone call with us. We'd be happy to chat with you. I'm very excited to talk about what will be happening over the course of the next two episodes. I have interviewed David Walker, former Comptroller General of the federal government. He was the CPA of the USA for 10 years under Bush and Clinton. He has written a new book called America in 2040, still a superpower where he talks about, he basically defines what a superpower is, why it's nice to be a superpower. He also talks about what are the ails facing our country? Why are we on a, such a fiscally unsustainable trajectory? We're going to talk about all of the problems facing the U.S. It's very interesting to get it right from the horse's mouth. He talks about the the implications of uh, our burgeoning debt load. He talks about all, all of the issues that are facing our country from a fiscal perspective, the, unsust- the day of reckoning for Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. So we're going to get into what David Walker says are the biggest fiscal challenges facing our country. We're going to do that this episode. And then next episode, we're going to talk about David Walker's solutions. And I think that it's going to add a lot of brightness and joy and hope to your day when we talk about some of these solutions, which I think are eminently achievable. So here is our interview with David Walker. Would you just remind our audience why you are qualified to opine on these financial issues. Talk talk a little bit about your background. I talk about it all the time, but I'd love to hear it right from you, what you did for 10 years under Bush and Clinton, what you've been doing since, and just fill our audience in a little bit on what occupies your time. An executive summary. I'm a certified public accountant by profession. I spent a lot of years in public accounting, including almost 10 years as a partner for Arthur Anderson, I've run three federal agencies, two in the executive branch, one in the legislative branch. The two in the uh, executive branch dealt with pensions and health care. I've been a trustee of Social Security and Medicare. The agency in the legislative branch that I ran is called the Government Accountability Office, where I was the Comptroller General of the United States. In English, that's Auditor General, Chief Performance and Accountability Officer of the United States. After that, I ran two not-for-profits focus on fiscal responsibility and sustainability at the federal, state, and local level. And more recently, I've been a distinguished visiting professor at the U.S. Naval Academy, teaching the economics of national security. And the last thing I would say is I have been and are on a number of boards and advisory groups dealing with fiscal, public policy, political, national security, and other issues. Okay. Yes. Uh, When I'm doing my frequent presentations, we often quote you and we say, why does it matter what David Walker says or has said in the past? And I usually say, because he knows more about these numbers than just about anyone else on the planet. So it's good to have really smart people that understand uh, what's at stake in terms of our current fiscal financial path. Now, in your book, you talk about how there are four things that define a superpower. Historically, over the course of the history of civilization, there's four things that define a superpower. Can you talk about those four things and and also talk about why we are on a trajectory where, according to your one of your possible outcomes, we could no longer be a superpower by 2040? First, there are four things that I posit that it takes to be a superpower global economic, diplomatic, and military power combined with global cultural influence. When you look at the post-World War II era, up until recently, I would respectfully suggest the United States is the only country that met that definition. The Soviet Union was clearly a diplomatic and military superpower 
but they were not an economic superpower and nor were they did they have cultural influence on a global basis. More recently, we see a re-emerging China. And I say re-emerging because China used to have the largest economy in the world. China used to have the largest navy in the world. So this is not the first time they've been a great power. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that if they haven't already met all the four of those criteria, uh, they will meet it in the near future. For example, now if you look at economics, the GDP on a purchasing power parity, China has already passed us. They haven't passed us on nominal dollars, but they've passed us on purchasing power parity, and they're on track to pass us on nominal dollars within the next uh, few years. If you look at the, uh, the diplomatic, they now have more embassies uh, and missions around the world than we do. If you look from the standpoint of militarily, I would argue they're the number two military power today, but they're dedicated to become number one. They're spending a lot of money on it. And then if you look at the cultural influence, their Belt and Road Initiative uh, has, deals with all of these dimensions. And in addition to that, believe it or not, Chinese investors own the largest movie chain in the United States called AMC Theaters. And that's part of their uh, you know, desire to try to end up having a cultural impact uh, on the United States, if you will. Bottom line is that we are still a superpower, but economics, demographics, and foreign alliances are starting to work against us rather than for us. And so it's important that we wake up, that we learn from history, that we heed the lessons from our nation's founders, and that we start to be able to change course so that we can make sure we remain a superpower and that our future is better than our past. Okay, you. thank you. You have a section uh, about the Founding Fathers. Now, I love the Founding Fathers. They were steeped in the classics. They were well acquainted with the superpowers that preceded them throughout history, and they understood which governing principles would really stand the test of time. And because they understood the history of government so well, they, they could draw from those principles that, that govern the most successful governments to that point, and they could call from those cumulative experiences and, and execute this great American experiment. You talk about the founders at great length in this book. Are the founding principles, are the words of our founders still relevant today? The reasons that we're having problems is because we've strayed from the principles and values on which uh, this country was founded, and they quite frankly made us great. Principles and values like limited but effective government, individual liberty and opportunity, personal responsibility and accountability, rule of law, fiscal responsibility, inter intergenerational equity, and stewardship. We've also not heeded the four warnings of George Washington to avoid foreign wars to not have excessive debt, to avoid regionalism and avoid factualism. And as David, I also point out in the book that we, we have some of the same challenges that Rome had before it fell. Political instability, moral decay, fiscal irresponsibility, inability to control its borders, and an overextended military. So it's really important that we learn from history and that we learn from others so that we can do what is necessary to stay great and to make sure that our children, grandchildren, and future generations have as much or more opportunity that we had. Amen. Let's shift gears and talk about COVID. We know that we were on an unsustainable fiscal course before COVID hit. We were racking up debt to the tune of a trillion dollars per year. COVID seems to have accelerated all that. Can you talk about the impact that COVID has had on our already tenuous fiscal situation, and maybe even touch upon some lessons we can learn from this. Sure. We were on an unsustainable fiscal path, as you mentioned, before COVID-19 hit, and now we're in much worse shape. Uh, in fiscal 2020, which ended on September 30, debt as a percentage of the uh, debt to GDP increased about 20% in one year for two reasons. One, we ran a over $3 trillion deficit, and secondly, GDP shrunk. And that's really the measure we need to be looking at. Not debt, not deficits, but debt to GDP. And we know that since September 30, there was a $900 billion bill passed dealing with COVID-19 in December. We were on top of that, 
We had another trillion dollar deficit that, that was a baseline deficit we were expected to have. And it's pretty clear that additional legislation is going to be, uh, be passed now that President Biden is going to be the next president and the Democrats will control the Senate and the House, albeit by very small margins. And, and so we need to do what it takes to defeat COVID-19, and we will defeat COVID-19. But we need to recognize uh, that once we do, we need to put a mechanism in place that will allow us to be able to make the tough choices to be able to get debt to GDP down to a reasonable, sustainable level over the next 10 to 20 years. It's doable, but it won't be done through the normal legislative process. It's going to take, in my view, a f fiscal uh, sustainability commission that is statutory, where the president and the Congress buys in up front, that engages the American people like I've done over the years with the facts, the truth, the tough choices, uh, and it sets the table for the Congress a range of social insurance reforms, spending reprioritizations and reductions, and, and, and revenue proposals that will be guaranteed a vote in Congress. That's what it's going to take. That's what we need. And I and others are going to try to help make it happen. Can you talk a little bit about, we, we know that what's driving the national debt is Social Security, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Can you talk about where we were in terms of the day of reckoning for those programs prior to COVID-19 and how much those days of reckoning have been accelerated as a result of COVID-19? Prior to COVID-19, the Social Security and Medicare trustees estimated that the trust funds which I call trust the government funds. The trust funds for Social Security on a combined basis were supposed to go to zero in 2035. Now, because of COVID-19, it's estimated to be 2031, four years earlier. And Medicare Part A, which is hospital insurance, it was supposed to go to zero before COVID-19 on 2026. Now that's been accelerated uh, to 2023, three years earlier. And what does that mean? When the trust fund goes to zero, you can only pay bill with bills with money that's in the trust fund. You'll still have revenue coming in for both, but it means that payments to hospitals would have to be cut 10 to 15% immediately and across the board. It means in the case of Social Security, that Social Security benefits would have to be cut 20 to 25% immediately and across the board. Quite frankly, both of those are unacceptable and undesirable outcomes all the more reason why we need to recognize reality and start making these tough choices sooner rather than later so the miracle of compounding can start working for us rather than against us, which it is now. Can you touch briefly, there seems to be no end in sight in terms of the debt. It doesn't seem like the government is, is dealing with it as a serious problem, and that is evidenced by each new budget that comes out year over year. Can you just explain to our listeners the implications of having debt interest, your, what, what you describe as non-discretionary expenses, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and then interest on the debt, you got to pay it. What are the implications of having debt just balloon over time and, and spiral out of control? What does that do vis-a-vis -vis the four litmus tests that you described earlier for a superpower? There are two real fiscal sustainability metrics you need to look at. The first one is debt as a percentage of the economy. And we have, we have passed the all-time record of debt to GDP, which was achieved right after World War II. But unlike the end of World War II, where we brought down debt to GDP dramatically between uh, 1945 and 1980, we're now adding debt to GDP at a, at a rapid rate. And are planning and expect to continue to add to it even after we defeat COVID-19. The second metric you have to look at is interest as a percentage of your budget. Because what do you get for interest? The answer is nothing, absolutely nothing. Right now, we're in an unusual situation because we're adding debt at record rates, but because interest rates are so low, our interest expense is not increasing. But that's temporary. And why is that happening? because we don't have regular market conditions right now. The Federal Reserve is self-dealing in U.S. debt. It is buying a significant percentage of all U.S. debt issues. It is artificially holding down interest rates in order to try to help with the economy and unemployment. That will not be sustained. 
The other reason that we have a problem is because you've got some liberal economists who've come up with this new modern monetary theory that basically says that deficits and debt don't matter as long as you can borrow in your own reserve currency unless and until you have excess inflation. We don't have excess inflation now, but if we but, but if we follow that theory, we will have excess inflation. And the only question is when and how much, because that theory is contrary to history. It's contrary to the long established macroeconomic principles. It's based upon a flawed comparison of the United States to Japan. And it's downright dangerous because politicians are already fiscally irresponsible. The last thing you want to do is give them an excuse to be even more fiscally irresponsible. Yeah, that was actually something I wanted to bring up because I'm not sure if you're familiar with Dr. Stephanie Kelton. She wrote The Deficit Myth. She actually, ironically, has the same literary agent as you and me. (laughs) She wrote a book called The Deficit Myth, and she appeared on MSNBC last night and said, GDP does not drive spending, drives GDP. So she's got it almost exactly backwards. And so I think that the scary part here is that there is a section of you. You talked about modern monetary theory. There's a contingent of economists that believes that the way out of our problem is by tapping into this quote unquote infinity bucket, our infinity, our, our ability to conjure money out of thin air. If that takes if that gains currency in the Biden administration, what happens to our fiscal condition between now and 2040? Understand this. The real issue is history has shown that when debt as a percentage of the economy reaches uh, unsustainable levels, that it has an adverse effect on economic growth. If it has an adverse effect on economic growth, it has an adverse effect on individual opportunity, meaning employment, uh, et cetera. Furthermore, as we've talked about already, over 70% of the budget is already on autopilot, all right? What's not on autopilot? All the express and enumerated responsibilities envisioned for the federal government by our founding fathers, national defense, homeland security, federal judicial system, infrastructure, a variety of other things. And so the bottom line is that this new theory is downright dangerous and it is fundamentally flawed. Stephanie Kelton, who did write the book Deficit Myth, uh, she was also an economic advisor to Bernie Sanders. Now you know why Bernie Sanders never had to answer the question on how much stuff was going to cost. He didn't care how much it was going to cost because his chief economic advisor was saying it doesn't matter. That is hogwash, absolutely hogwash. And it's, I do not believe that Biden will buy into that. And I'm confident that that a lot of members of Congress will not buy into it as well. But what the real key is, what are we going to do to be in a position to make the tough choices on spending and revenues that have to be made? What are we going to do and when are we going to do it? Can you can you talk briefly? There's a lot of there, there's a lot of thought that the way we can get out of our problems, if not by printing our way out of them, is by simply taxing the rich. Is that a viable long term strategy? For example, Joe Biden has insisted that his new tax plan will make permanent the Trump tax cuts for those making less than four hundred thousand, but that those that are making more than four hundred thousand dollars, they're going to be have, have their taxes revert back to pre twenty eighteen levels, and that he will throw an additional fourteen percent on top to pay for Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid over time to shore up those programs. And those and that fourteen percent tax goes on ad infinitum. Is this a way in terms of taxation? Is this a a, a viable way to solve our long term issues? First, we're going to have additional revenues. The problem is primarily a spending problem, but you're not going to be able to solve the problem solely with economic growth and through spending reductions. We're going to have additional revenues. And the sad thing is, the longer we wait, the higher the revenue amount is going to have to be. Why? Two reasons. Compounding, okay, and math, the new four-letter word in fiscal policy, math. And secondly, political reality, because the people who are most active politically are seniors, And the programs that are going to have to be reformed to one extent or another disproportionately affect seniors. 
And, and yes, there's going to have to be additional revenues. Yes, it's going to have to be to increase the progressivity uh, and equity of our tax system. One of the things that will be talked about is a wealth tax. There's no question that there's going to be some conversation about a wealth tax. But you cannot solve our problem solely by taxing the rich. The numbers don't come close to working. So does that um, <laughs> contemplate a broadening of the tax base? And will Main Street America have to start kicking more into the kitty? There's absolutely no question that we're that the tax base is going to have to be broadened. And there's absolutely no question that individuals in most income levels will end up paying more taxes. And I think the other thing that you need to understand, and I know you do, David, because it's part of what the power of zero is all about, tax rates will never be lower than they are now. And contrary to what many people have told us for many years that, oh, gee, you want to defer as much. Uh, income as you can, because you're probably going to end up paying a lower tax rate when you're retired than you are when you're working. That no longer is a credible assumption. So back in 2000, back in 2009, you wrote a, a CNN op-ed article. It's been widely read and widely distributed, where you you predict that tax rates could have to double to keep our country solvent. In retrospect. You still feel good about that prediction, or has it gotten worse? Where where, where are tax rates headed? Uh, they could have to all uh, double just based upon the principle of math. The real question is, what percentage can we achieve through spending reductions, which includes social insurance reforms, and whatever the difference is, we'll get plugged to revenues. And the longer we wait to make the changes, the higher the percentage is going to have to be for revenues, for the reasons that I told you. Uh, and unfortunately, we're in worse shape now than we were in 2009. And in 2010, there was the simpson Bowles Commission, which I also talk about in my book. But unfortunately, President Obama abandoned the simpson Bowles Commission. And about probably 80 to 85 percent of their proposals had a lot of merit, but nothing's been done. And yet, we're in much worse shape now than we were in 2010. Okay, folks, thanks for listening. Uh, as you can see, David Walker is a real pro. He's in the CPA Hall of Fame. He's just, number one, he's a great guy. Like I said, he's a personal hero of mine. I think he's an American hero and really understands these numbers just about as well, if not better than anyone else in the world. So this is somebody that we want to pay attention to. Next week, we will be talking about David Walker's solutions. So we've talked about the mess that we're in. How do we get ourselves out on it? Out of it, that's going to be next week. Once again, if you're looking for someone to help you navigate all of the complexities of getting to the 0% tax bracket, head to davidmcknight.com. And if you're an advisor and want help transitioning your practice to a power of zero practice, head on over to powerofzero.com. Thanks everybody for attending and we'll talk to you same time next week. <music>